Welcome to Mind Freedom's Alternative Mental Health Radio, hosted by Board President Celia Brown. For those of you who are tuning into our show for the first time, Mind Freedom International is a nonprofit organization that unites 100 sponsor and affiliate grassroots groups with thousands of individual members to win human rights and alternatives for people labeled with psychiatric disabilities. We have been around in one form or another for over 30 years. Find out more about our work on our website, www.mindfreedom.org. If you call our main office based in Eugene, Oregon, 541-345-9106, or our East Coast office based in New York, 914-668-8811, be sure to ask to be put on our email list for regular updates about events and programs. And now, here's our host, Celia Brown. Uh, Welcome, everyone. Um, My name is Celia Brown, and I'm a psychiatric survivor and activist, and I'm the board president of Mind Freedom International. I have um, one announcement I'd like to share with our listeners. is Our beloved Leonard Royd Frank uh, passed away on January 16th. He was a widely respected psychiatric survivor, activist, author, and electroshock survivor. We have more information about his life on our website, um, www.mindfreedom.org. Rest in peace, Leonard. In a minute, we'll be joined by health advocate and nutritional advisor James Jordan's CNC calling in from Oregon. In the first half of the show, I'll ask Jim a few questions Then we'll open it up, the call in line for your questions. If you have questions for our guest today, please wait about 20 minutes. Then call the listener line, which is 917-932-1736. 917-932-1736. At Mind Freedom, we're developing a new program called MFI Health Connections, based on recent developments in the fields of natural health and psychology. These developments lead lead us to ask some vitally important questions with great potential to help millions of people around the world. How can the Mad Pride Movement or the Consumer Survivor Movement benefit from a holistic, more health-conscious perspective which emphasizes more natural solutions in response to emotional trauma and depression. And what does it mean to have a health-orientated lifestyle? Is it possible to leave powerful psychiatric drugs out of the inqu- out of the equation entirely? Today we'll explore the latest information about the surprisingly close link between diet and nutrition and one's mental health. Whether people are looking to avoid depression or recovering from the abuses of a system that relies too much on drugs, many people are finding great results through natural healing modalities. After hearing author and nutrition advisor and Mind Freedom member James Jordan, we think you'll find his reasoning sound and his hope contagious. James Jordan is a health and wellness consultant, an active active advocate based in Southern Oregon. He was on the staff at the Optimum Wellness Center, the largest holistic medical clinic in the Chicago area, from 2000 through 2004, and for two years had a private practice in Oak Park, Illinois, offering a variety of health and wellness seminars and trainings to healthcare practitioners. Beginning in 2007, James moved to Oregon and opened a private nutrition consulting practice, always staying on the cutting edge of the health and wellness field. His ongoing education includes a doctoral program in natural healing. Just last fall, James launched his first book, Your Health is in Your Hands, The Three Reasons You're Not Well and What to Do About It. Formerly a Chicago lawyer, Jim's artist's road to recovery from a devastating illness in the 80s helped him discover his true passion, 
helping others find vib- vibrant health for themselves. Since then, he's been an unrelenting advocate for people everywhere to take responsibility for their own health and trust their their instincts instead of giving over their bodies and themselves to any expert, doctor or otherwise. So we'd like to welcome Jim. Hi. Jim, are you there? Hi, Jim. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. How are you? Very good. How are you doing? Good, good. So I'm um, it's so good for you to be here today and kind of ask you some questions for our okay. audience. Uh, Jim, tell us about your journey from Chicago, from a Chicago lawyer to nutrition and health consultant and advocate. Okay. Well, I was um, actually in law school in Chicago at Loyola University, and it was 1983 when my health collapsed. I had a health crisis in between my second and third year years of law school. Wow. Um, started with chronic infections urinary tract infections, fatigue, depression, um, indigestion problems, you know, constipation. I just was a wreck. I felt like I I just felt miserable for that whole summer. I I went to doctors, you know, conventional doctors. You know, they treated me with antibiotics, and I went to counseling, to uh, psychotherapy. And it's... Um, and then I started a, a journey where I started investigating alternative healing. It took me, it took me quite a while actually to get my health completely together. I, I had an up and down period for about five or six years, where I <clears throat> I would periodically get some energy and then I would collapse and then I'd get some energy and collapse. And I was working as a lawyer. You know, I did finish law school, practice law for a while, passed the bar exam, but um, my health was never really good until I. Finally, through a lot, you know, I document this more in my book, the first uh, one of the chapters of my background. Finally, yeah. I decided to take more responsibility myself for my health and um, and actually build health instead of focusing on the health problems I had. Yeah. Uh, the labels were chronic fatigue syndrome, depression, uh, allergies, all kinds of things I had. Um, I started focusing on building a foundation of health. From that point, um, by the end of the 80s, I really recovered my health. I was in excellent health. I practiced law for a few more years, and then I decided to to leave it. My heart wasn't in it. Um, you can imagine that I my, I had a real passion for health and healing at that point. Wow, that's wonderful, Jim. Um, and would you say, you know, um, going to medical doctors, would you say that was part of the problem? Well, I mean, there's a place for everything. I, 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 it was um, useful to get a diagnosis um, to understand what was going on. And um, the I can't problem. I'd say that the biggest problem is not thinking for yourself, taking responsibility for your own health. Whenever right. you your own power to somebody else, you have the potential for, it may not be in, in, intentional, uh, but it just, it's just it's not empowering to you. So when I decided to take responsibility, and doctors are useful, um, alternative practitioners are useful, but they all, in a sense, end up working for you, the person. You're the right. boss, you're in charge, you can decide who, who you want to put your energy into, who you want to trust. So really the first step is to take to say that my health is a result of my choices. Wow, and, and that, that's that's a good approach. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I don't know the, you know, I, I guess I was diagnosed to somebody with depression. I had insomnia, depression, anxiety, nervous, a lot of nervous energy, and but I did come to understand what were the factors that were causing it. I wasn't going to treat just the symptoms. I really wanted yeah. to go to the... So does that does that make sense to to you? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You know, at Mind Freedom, there are some people who have suffered from depression, and it's remarkably common in our society. Why is it so common, and what solutions, in your experience, have worked best for your clients? Well, that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of um, you know, it's 
let me start with the basic idea that in my book, I talk about the three reasons you're not well and what to do about it. So those three reasons apply to pretty much everything from my experience. I mean, I have 17 years in clinical nutrition now. Um, so it's a combination okay. of there is there is of course um, life itself, stress and trauma, uh, losing someone you love, losing your career, um, all kinds of things. Events in life can trigger depression. Um, yeah. So a lot the, the the areas that are not as well explored by um, conventional medicine are the areas of nutrient deficiencies and toxicity. Right. Oh, right. I lay that out as, as, as a general principle in my book, and it can be applied to anything. You need to be, one needs to be like a detective in a way to investigate mm-hmm. their diet and life, to find out what what areas do they need to put attention. So there's a lot of research now on nutrient deficiencies and depression. You know, the B vitamins are all essential for brain chemistry to work properly. Any deficiency of an essential nutrient could be a contributing factor to a depressive episode or even chronic depression. Now, it might be a combination of several things, though. It might not just be a group of nutrient deficiencies. It might be that layered on top of losing your career, your job, having a a loved one break up with you, um, Mm -hmm. and some other toxicity, some other factors. But when you look at the entire picture, you can get to see what is the overall causation of the depression. So I encourage people to look at all the variables and then to sort of make a list of things to do to, you know, I have a list here for me to talk about with you know, with people at some point if they want to know, but there's a okay. list of things to do and then see which ones apply to you and then start to correct them. Right. And can you explain this, uh, you know, this approach in helping your clients who come to you with health issues? Yeah, I mean, it's different for different people. I do a lot of my work now is by distance. Um, people call me from around the country based on some videos they might have seen of me or perhaps my book now that my book is out. And um, So I do an evaluation. I get their history. Sometimes there's okay. tests that are run. Some of the, the background I get are just surveys, you know, like a stress survey, um, mm-hmm basic surveys that I use, but often there's tests that I run for nutrient deficiencies and toxicities or sometimes bowel function. You know, if you have, there's now a strong correlation between gut health and brain health. Oh, so really? Test. Yeah, there's a lot, if you, you know, just there's gut-brain connection. So there's, um, sometimes I have tests run on the uh, intestinal ecology to see if there's um, an overgrowth of some pathogens in the gut. And then you can, so that will impact. And I'm not talking just about mental health. Usually I, right. my clients, not the primary reason they call me. That's usually a secondary factor. Yeah. But we do an assessment, and then I give recommendations. I give a program. We develop a program that covers nutrition, lifestyle, um, exercise. Sometimes there's things that I refer people to, other practitioners to deal with traumas or how to release traumatic events in their life or deal with stress. So when you have a holistic approach, recovering all the bases, um, chance of success is a lot higher. That was was my experience, myself and for the patients I worked with in the medical clinic. So, so, uh, Jim, how do you recommend people protect themselves from the stresses of life in a polluted, alienating society? Are there social psychological recommendations you include in your book to stay healthy? Yeah, there's um, there's a section on stress at the end. Now, and I, this is means a a complete list, but I I have a section called adopting a wellness mindset. Um, okay. This is just basic, and I can if you would you want me to read you some of the suggestions I have? Yeah, that? could you? That'd be great. Okay, so um, these are just some basic things I thought would be helpful for anybody to have a wellness mindset. So the things that impact our mood, our state of mind, our mental health. The first thing I recommend for people to do is to acknowledge the aspects of your health that are working well for you already. Okay. I mean by that, um, 
it's like a lot of times people have had health struggles and their whole focus is on my problems. You know, I got I'm on right. this, since I feel depressed, it's, nothing's working. I remember I had a client come into my office in Chicago one day and she said to me, she sat down, she started crying. She said, nothing is working for me. No, nothing in my health is working. And I looked at her and I said, um, you know, I don't believe you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, you, you, you're, you're walking just fine. You don't have a limp. You see? She said, yeah, the truth is I walk pretty well. I said, um, yeah. do you have glasses? She said, no, no glass, no, no, no contacts. I said, well, your eyesight is perfect. And I said, mine's not. So I started going through some things to listen. And she's walking well, aside of about five or six things that weren't. So her whole attitude changed towards the whole experience of working on her health. She said, you know, to emphasize what's working well is the starting point. And then putting things more in perspective. Does that does that make sense to you? Oh yeah, because I I know that you know when you have or are diagnosed with a you know a health uh issue, you're focusing on that and not being well. And I think that's a really good approach, Jim. Yeah, thanks. It's just something that I found out for myself when I was sick, too. So I, I asked people yeah. to list in about their health that's good, number one. Two, right. ask them to make sure um, that there's no major nutritional deficiencies that could be undermining their mental health. So then we do, you know, you do some assessments, you develop a program that covers the basic deficiencies that people have, you know, the vitamin, mineral, fatty acid thing, you know, all kinds of deficiencies people can have and they're not aware of it. So cover the basic nutritional deficiencies. Um, The next thing I'd say is that people, or more with people in society now, is that so much of their time is spent indoors on a computer with artificial light. They're not really in nature. They're not living the way we were designed to live. So I ask people to make an, make a, a, pr- a priority of being outdoors, in sunlight, in nature. Yeah. That's going to help your state of mind. Um, wow. Maybe there's some studies on this, maybe not, but perhaps it's yeah. common sense. But I say be outside and do what you... Take time to do things you enjoy doing in life. A lot of us... I'm as guilty as anybody is are workaholics, just working all the time and not really doing things that when we were children, you know, life was more about fun. So I say now yeah. as an adult, pick something you love to do and prioritize that in your week. Just make sure that it's you're doing whatever it is, whether it's gardening or golfing or or walking or whatever it is, dancing, doing what you love in life. And less time different. on the Internet or social media. Which less I know all time, yeah. of us are involved with. Exactly, less time. So this is advice for myself, too, of course. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> so, Jim, so, there's a lot being written about the GAPS diet and mental health issues. What is GAPS, and how can it help people suffering with health issues that manifest as uh, psychological symptoms? The gut and psychology syndrome diet is... Um, um, a diet that focuses on healing the gut. And okay. the principle is that's the, the gut-brain connection that I'm talking about. Um, and I know a lot of people that are on it. I put some of my clients on it. It's a diet that emphasizes um, avoiding foods that imbalance in your intestinal, gut, intestinal flora. So okay. sugars, gluten grains, and um, and it also includes foods that are that are um, helpful at building and repairing the gut flora and the gut lining. So there's a focus on bone broth, which has some um, amino acids and nutrients that help repair the, the, the gut. The, 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 uh, there's, a con- there's a principle called um, leaky gut um, phenomenon where the gut allows, there's a damage to the gut lining, waste washes into the bloodstream, undigested proteins mm-hmm. wash into the bloodstream, and create havoc, inflammation in the body, all kinds of problems. So the and and how do you know if that's working? If the GAPS diet works, is there a blood test, or how do you know 
I would have personally yeah. know that that's working. There's there's tests you can run for that. Um, there's there's tests that I did in a clinic that would verify that, and then ultimately there's the the response of the person and they're feeling better and their moods are better, their energy is better, they have less inflammation and pain. They so it's both subjective and objectively verified. Right, right. One that sounds great. Uh, in your experience, Jim, how have pharmaceuticals played havoc with people's health, and how common has it been for your clients to ask for help in getting off of them? Well, um, I get when I worked in a medical clinic in Chicago. I worked with okay. a doctor whose commitment was to helping patients get off medications. Um, wow. It's a, a personal decision um, for people to decide. So if a person decides to get off medication, um, they should talk to their doctors, obviously see what is the risk of that, and they should have a plan to do it in cooperation with the doctor's support. Um, so I do have people that co- come to see me that they want to get off medication, so I make sure that they're in communication with the doctor that prescribed the medication or a doctor who is currently taking care of them. And the doctors are trained in how to um, to ratchet down the medication, to drop the, 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 the dosage down gradually, or to switch them to a milder medication. And then if you get the correct nutritional support, there's depending on what the medication is for, there's different nutritional formulas that will provide the nutrient um, precursors to um, reestablish healthy brain chemistry. Uh, right. If you do that... In- a doctor who knows how to, to to recommend to drop the dosage down slowly and safely, then people can recover. People can get off medications. There was a patient in the clinic I worked in Chicago who was on five iatric drugs, mood balancing drugs, and um, very complicated. You know, very difficult to get off that. But it took her about two and a half years working with the doctor I worked with, myself, and some other people in the clinic to completely be free of all the medications. It was a very difficult case, but it was successful. So if she could get off all those medications, I knew that other people could too if they want to and if it's safe for them. You know, this is something that's it's very clear. It has to be between the doctor and the patient. There are right. people that are on medications that I've found that I really, no matter how much they wanted to, it was very difficult to get them off. And there's others that could get off. Yeah. So it's... Well, we ha- we have Mind Freedom members who've worked with some doctors who still believe they need to take psychiatric drugs, even though they have all these side effects. And so we have sort of like a movement now of people who are working together to come off of psychiatric drugs with some advice. But, you know, in the mental health system, the form of treatment is psychiatric drugs, and you know if you're not doing well on them um it's it's sort of it's revolutionary to get off of them and to work to, you know together with other like-minded people to get you know you, you know to change your life and i understand that you should do it with a doctor and i agree with it but i think sometimes it's hard to find a doctor that can help you get off of psych drugs. And I'm wondering if the clinic you're talking about, would that be helpful for some uh, Mind Freedom members? Yeah, it would be. I mean, and there are doctors that um, that help, That you know, there's if you look around, you can find them. And also there's sometimes the doctor may not be the primary signer of the program to get you off the medication, but they can sort of monitor the reduction in the dosage. So clients that okay. I see, I'm the one who's giving them the nutritional advice, uh, but I they're see. in communication with their doctor. Their doctor is approved of it. I mean, because there's drugs are very powerful, and there's uh, yeah. dangers, dangers to get off of them too fast. But if there's right. communication with the doctor, or if you find a doctor who's willing to help you, the there's doctors... Well, that will will be it. Well, uh, they may be communication with their doctor. Their doctor's approved of it. I mean, because there's drugs are very. There was a little. Uh... Hello. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now I hear you. 
you were sort of fading before. Okay, so it's it's basically um, it's ultimately the patient's choice, really. The patient decides yes. what they want to do. The person the person decides. I don't want to call them a patient. Right. Person decides what. And then it's their responsibility to find the people to support them to do that. If their doctor right. is is just not interested in 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 getting them off drugs, then find a doctor who is, if that's what you want. Um, yeah. And then find somebody who can guide you through that process. Somebody trained properly, or somebody who understands this. How does you basically have to reestablish a foundation of health? You have right. to establish a foundation, a lifestyle foundation, a dietary foundation of health, an emotional foundation of health, all the variables, and then from that foundation, uh, the changes can be made. Uh, gradual changes can be made to get people off of medications if they. Not all cases are successful, but many are if they have the proper support. So, um, so the IRC. Mike, um, what's that? Check it and see if you see me. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Jim, I want to also mention, uh, which was done from the Icarus Project called the Harm Reduction um, of Coming Off of Psychiatric Drugs. You can download it on their website, um, okay. and it's been very, very helpful to people. I just wanted to bring that up to our listeners. Oh, great. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, it, it can be a tricky situation. The longer a person's medications are on, the more complicated it is. In some right. cases, like, um, it was not hard at all because there was one medication the doctor was very supportive. The, the the client was very willing, and it was not that difficult to do. So there's all there's a full range of possibilities of people. But yeah. the first thing though is it is possible. It is possible to right. one. Right. And um, in my view, um, health, mental health is is part of overall health. It's not something that's separate from health. Right. It's, I totally agree, and I think a long time that's why we've seen. Well, that's how the system seen health. Health is over here, and then you go to mental health over there. But you, how do you disconnect the body, <laughs> the mind, body, and spirit? It's you know. Yeah, it's all connected, and there's and all. And I was reading a great article on the health benefits of exercise. And exercise is something that you know we've all you know people know it's good for their their muscles and for their heart. But people don't know that it's helpful for regulating insulin resistance, boosting serotonin and dopamine and GABA. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. health, brain health. So, so part of any plan that I have includes an eating plan, an exercise, you know, exercise to the level that you're capable of exercising, um, lifestyle adjustments, being outdoors, less time at the computer, more time in nature, uh, right. lots of other things. So, Jim, I have another question. Uh, what what role does allergies or food intolerances play in health issues that may manifest as psychological symptoms? Well, um, it depends on the severity of the allergy. Allergies can be mild reactions, you know, like a little, you know, mucus formation or uh, indigestion. But mm -hmm. allergies also can be create inflammation in the body, reduce oxygen, you know, supply to the brain. Um, they could create a toxic condition in the body. So it's, I mean, I can't say it's the only factor, but allergies would be a factor in in any in any in any aspect of health. But it's usually a combination of multiple things. So allergies is I had a lot of allergies when I was in my six year health challenge. Yeah. It cleared up when I healed my gut. So allergies are really a result of of it, poor digestion, not eating correctly. Some there's mm -hmm. some allergies, and others are a result of poor digestion. Then the the body responds to the proteins, undigested proteins, with an allergy response. So oh, okay. And uh, our last question. Then we're going to go to callers. Uh, what role does pollution, heavy metals, pesticides, air pollution, et cetera, play in health issues that manifest as psychological symptoms? 
Well, it's another part of the whole causation um, my personal experience when I had in my 20s uh, when I was very sick I had depression and anxiety um, one of the things I found out that was affecting my health was a, a mercury toxicity from my dental wow. work mercury toxicity c- uh, contributed to my depression and anxiety okay. and I have ex- actually have periods of rage that would come from this toxicity. Now, as I cleared that toxicity up, my mood stabilized. This is really? across, the board in my obser- across the board in my observation when the, the patients came to the clinic I worked in in Chicago. When they had high levels or even moderately high levels of heavy metals, their nervous system was impacted. So, again, there's lots of research on this on the Internet if you want to Look around. Right. But right. so in my view, toxicity and nutrient deficiencies are the, the two pillars to address for any health condition. Stress and trauma I work less with directly because that's not my training, but it is the other yeah. pillar. That would be the third leg. And um, so I think to, to be conscious of how toxicity, whether it's cut from the environment or from your diet or wherever mm-hmm. it's coming from, is impacting your health is is crucial to establish good health. And, and let me and you and I just one more question I have: What role does the changing media environment, hyperstimulation, and mediation have on children and all of our brains? Hope that's not what too difficult. Does, what well, what role media? does the changing media environment, hyperstimulation? have on children, video games, computers, on all of our brains. Well, um, you know, there was, again, there's research on this too, but everybody's going to come to their own conclusion. Uh, my My opinion is that our bodies are designed to be in nature. We should have natural sunlight regularly. We should be exercising outdoors. Spending, you know, large periods of time in front of a computer playing games, little devices that are putting out low levels of electromagnetic fields are, is not the healthiest way for your nervous system to operate, your hormones to operate. So mm-hmm. I would say moderation with with games and stuff like that. And more more people more people need to get outdoors, basically, and right. get fresh air. Okay, in, in the fresh air. <clears throat> so I want to give the number again for our... Um, for our listeners, uh, please call in to 917-932-1736. Uh, Jonah, any call callers? Uh, Celia, we don't have any calls yet, but we just put the number out. So if you have any questions for James today, the number to call, do you have it again there, Celia? 917-932-1736. Okay, uh, Julia, Julia, do you want to ask one of your questions? Because uh, I asked one of them. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Good I job. just wanted to actually uh, uh, follow up for a moment on um, on elaborating on the harm reduction guide to coming off of psychiatric drugs. Uh, the Icarus Project, uh, spearheaded by Will Hall from Madness Radio and, uh, and elsewhere, um, is now in its second edition, and it's a guide that actually is meant to be a harm reduction guide. <laughs> If people have ever heard the term harm reduction, it comes out of uh, needle exchange and um, uh, the HIV movement, you know, with condom distribution, where uh, there's an acknowledgement that folks are actually going to be uh, taking certain actions and trying to reduce the possible harm that those actions might might produce. And so the harm reduction guide acknowledges that some people might decide to come off the of psych drugs and tries to outline some of the safest ways to do so. Um, It's actually a tragedy and a scandal that the FDA has not released information about the side effects of withdrawal from psych drugs. Okay, the British FDA has put this out publicly, but when you come off of psych drugs too quickly or too sharply, the symptoms produced and the disequilibrium produced by coming off of those drugs too quickly can often look like psychosis, and the next thing you know, you're coming off an antidepressant, and you're diagnosed with bipolar, and the cycle continues. So so the harm reduction guide 
is available free for download. You can find it on the Icarus Project site, IcarusProject.net. And you can also order a hard copy from Amazon if you just search for Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off of Psychiatric Drugs. Uh, that's available on Amazon and, and elsewhere. Uh, it's put Thanks, out by AK John, Press, which is, yeah. And then, and then, James, I guess I was just wanted to follow up on the on the media environment, and I think you could think of media as a kind of diet and nutrition that folks are on as well. But, you know, we've seen uh, a 4,000% increase in the diagnosis of children with pediatric bipolar, with bipolar between 94 and 04, and the numbers for the last yeah. decade aren't even out yet. Um, I've long thought that we can account for this discrepancy. I mean, you know, has children's behavior changed? Has our judgment towards it changed? Probably very complex. But maybe this discrepancy could be as simple as considering the stress and the boredom that these kids are subjected to. Namely, they're in school, they're stressed out, no child left behind, metal detectors in the school. But like to your point, with no art, no recess, no play, no nature, even before you get to the high fructose corn syrup, with 45 yeah. kids in the classroom, wouldn't you be surprised if these kids weren't exhibiting behavioral, you know, issues? Yeah. And I'm concerned that the system has decided to solve this problem, quote-unquote solve, by chemically swallowing these children and putting them on sedatives in the form of antipsychotics. Absolutely. So, Jim, um, Jim, what is your thoughts on that? There's a great book called The Taste That by Russell Blaylock. He's a doctor. So he talks about the chemical uh, causes of this, the, the, the ADD and ADHD and all this. So, um, you know, also in the food, artificial sweeteners, preservatives, on top of, you know, sugary diets, on top of not enough uh, time outdoors and excess exposure to computers, it's a combination of factors. So I've seen, I've seen this happen time and time again and with adults, too. I have a lot of adult clients that have attention deficit. So the book that I would recommend on that, I think, is The Taste That Kills. That ha- that, that'll that inform people about the um, the chemicals in the food that are contributing to these attention disorders, these conditions that children and adults have. All right, let me just repeat the number. We're welcoming your calls in to ask questions or comments to Jim, Jim Jordan. It's 917-932-1736. 917-932-1736. I'm also going to interject something about uh, Jim's website. He has a lot of good information uh, about his services and about the uh, issues that he's talking about. And his website is uh, createvibranthealth.com. Uh, you can find out more about Jim and his services and his book and uh, lots of good resources on his website. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Well, we're Any other questions or do you want me to just... What did you say, John? That was Jim. Oh, Jim. No, are there, are there any other questions that you have, or do you want me to Yeah, uh, I think, I think talk? we're still waiting for callers. I'm not sure if we had a chance to promote this show. We've, we've been on hiatus for a couple of months here since uh, we've been trying to reconvene the radio show um, uh, since David No, Oaks, it went know, out. It went out, Jonah. It went out. Uh, John sent it all over the place. I did, too. So. Okay, great. I'm not sure how many live listeners we have. I know we have quite a few subscribers that are going to listen over the podcast, but until we get some live... Uh, some live listeners calling in, and please, we encourage you all to call in at 917-932-1736. Um, James, do you have any, I mean, Jim, John, do you have any questions for James? Uh, I don't think Jim had much of a chance to go into the detail about uh, the, the fundamental the causation uh, paradigm that he uses in his practice. Uh, if you want to go more into that or, or um, oh, that finish great. what you were talking about. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, my book, the reason, let me tell you about my book, okay? I wrote this book because I kept, basically, every single person I saw, I would review these things over and over and over again, thousands of times over 17 years. But wouldn't it be nice to just write it down once, tell people before they come to see me to read it, okay? so that, And the reason this is so important is that, from my view, if you don't understand, if you don't have the understanding of the general factors that are in 
All the attention is going to go to treat the symptoms, the manifestation of these causes. That's what that psychiatric drugs are. They're treating the symptom, not the cause. So what I decided to do was to write this down in as simple way as I could, and well, it's simple enough, and some people it's not, but it's my, my attempt to make it understandable, starting with nutrition. Nutrition is the foundation. So the first chapter is, the first chapter that's driven wise other than the, my background is about nutrient deficiencies laying out the foundation of what percentage of people are deficient in key nutrients now key nutrients even any B vitamin deficiency any B vitamin deficiency could lead a or a mood disorder okay B1 you know B1 deficiency depression irritability anxiety B3 deficiency psychosis and dementia B6 deficiency, depression, mood swings, B12 deficiency, every single nutrient, they're, they're essential nutrients because your body can't function without them. So what I tell people is that a lot of people have nutrient deficiencies and they're not aware of it. They're clinical, they're masked over by caffeine or alcohol or medications. They're not addressed the cause, the cause of their health condition. So that's Phase one is learn how to eat correctly and learn how to assess deficiencies. Cover those deficiencies, and and deficiencies can include even water. I mean, it's estimated that about 90% of the population is dehydrated to some degree. People don't drink water regularly. They drink coffee and tea and soda pop. They don't have enough water for actually the, the body to assimilate the nutrients and to flush out the toxins that are accumulated in their cells. And does this resonate at all here with with you guys? Yeah, yeah, no, that sounds absolutely accurate to me. And people mistake, you know, their headaches. I mean, dehydration for headache. I mean, you get a headache when you're dehydrated. You get tired, and like, and then and then they, they exactly. drink more coffee, which is a diuretic. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And so, and even their blood sugar imbalances or some hormone imbalances, they start to get depressed because of that or they don't sleep well, then they get tired and they have insomnia, then they get a medication for the depression or the insomnia, when all they needed actually was to balance their blood sugar, regulate their hormones properly with the right fats and the right ratio of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, and then they wouldn't have that condition. So they're being treated with drugs before you're being treated with water and food. So as simple as actually knowing how to eat and drink, drink water and eat properly, digest your food properly, make sure your food has all the nutrients it has in it or that you get those nutrients in through supplements, that's the beginning of health. That's when I when I really realized how nutrient deficient we all are. My in my health crisis in my 20s, that's when it, that's when the light bulb went off and said I can solve my health problems with correct nutrition. And so that's the foundation. This is the beginning of of health and not and, and for a lot of people, they don't want to think about food because they're so attached to eating the way they want to eat or eating the way being based on what their body actually needs. Body, each person's body is unique, so there is no one diet for everybody. There's a system of nutrition assessment that uh, the clinic I worked in used called metabolic typing, which was helpful to the, to identify which diet, which food eating plan was best for each person. So again, the correct plan for yourself, beginning of health. That's I don't know if that's so. Um, so uh, so wait. So James, do you recommend actually finding a qualified or certified nutritionist? Or how can people actually take best stock? Should they just start keeping track of what they're eating and reflect on it? Are there diets that you think are beneficial or detrimental or protein? I mean, there's so many fads out there. You know, Weight Watchers seems like, you know, stable, but like, you know, gluten-free, uh, uh, yeah. protein only. Like, like, are there any that you think are like uh, really effective or it's differed by every single person individually? Like, how should people think about or approach their own nutritional health? That's a very good question. There is a yeah, lot of... Yeah, I like that. So um, here's the thing. Um, it depends on what level of health... How, how motivated are you to have optimal health? If you're highly motivated, you'll study. 
purpose of my study was to talk to people that were smarter than I was, that had better results than I did when I was in my 20s. I found people that were healthy, practitioners, even some patients at offices I went to were much smarter than the doctors even in certain areas. So I, I, I personally think that what you should do is um, keep a journal about how you eat. Learn the basics. Truthfully, get my book, okay? My book would give you the basics for, for a few bucks, okay? And, and you can understand that's the right, foundation. It's At least e-book. just, what, pardon me. Uh, it's an e-book. I just wanted to mention. Oh, can they b- also buy it as well? Or yeah, it's an e-book. It's a print-on-demand. But in my book, I give you the the, the the basic principle of every meal should have protein, carbohydrates, and fats in it. The ratios are dependent upon how your body processes those macronutrients. So then, so the concept comes up with you know how to get the best diet for yourself. There is no one diet. I mean, generally, avoid processed food. Make sure you get good quality organic food. Make sure you have enough protein and fat. That's the thing people are missing more of. They're usually, usually pe- the average mistake is too many carbohydrates. Jim, we have a caller, Judy from New York, um, wants to ask factors in mind and body. Um, Judy? Yes. I can ask Jim, how are you? I'm okay, how are you? Good. Hi, Judy. Hi, is this Jim? Yeah, I'm here in Oregon. Hi, Jim. Hi. Hi, Um, Jim. So I'm interested in, I actually just saw a film last night uh, called Connections about about, um, a lot of people, um, doctors and psychologists and so on, who are who are and have been working on the whole mind body connection and the um you know the very real and scientifically tangible uh you know um proofable you know for lack of a better way of putting it um mind body connection that exists and they had a lot of examples of people who had been diagnosed with serious illnesses who used things like yoga and meditation and and different mind techniques to help heal themselves. So I was just wondering how that if that figured into your work at all and what your thoughts were on that topic. Thanks, Judy, for that question. Um, yeah, the uh, mind-body connection is the reality. It goes both ways. Your moods can affect how your body feels and your biochemistry can affect your moods. So Right. In my in my book, I talk about in the, in the section on stress, things to do to get your you know your mind more calm, more attuned to mm-hmm. nature or your true nature. Mm. And, how, and yoga. how would you describe that true nature? Like, how would you describe that true nature? Oh, that's a good one. Um, my belief, my personal belief, is that our true nature is spirit. Is is mm-hmm. is is um. Prior to the physical body, so our true nature, I would say, is is a, is a lot more relaxed than our mental nature in general. Okay, mm-hmm. so meditate, you get relaxed. It's because your mind sort of falls away, your obsessive thinking falls away. And my experience of my true nature, when I've had meditations or spiritual experiences, I'm very relaxed, very clear-headed, and I have insights into things I normally don't have insights into. Mm-hmm helps facilitate that. If it's being in nature, if it's um, meditation or prayer, anything that facilitates that is... Your question? I'm sorry? Does that answer your question? or? Um... Yeah, 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 yeah. I just wanted to um, I just wanted to open it up. I haven't had a chance to read your whole book, but um, you know, okay. I just wanted to get your, throw that in and get your feedback. So thank you. Yeah, it helped me when I was in my healing crisis. I um, I got very much into a meditation and a sort of spiritual path that helped me go of a lot of my angst and, and anger and frustration. I got mm. a lot more calm and centered, and that was without a doubt um, my health recovery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it would it would be hard to recover from. Um, Anything when you're, you know, 
constantly having stress responses, like when you're in a constant state of stress response. You know, and um, I, I think it is possible, and this film is talking about, and, I, you know, I think you're confirming, you know, it's really possible to build up what's called the relaxation response and have that be your your dominant um, kind of fear, you know, and, and how and that would definitely affect various neurotransmitters and things that are going on in the body. Yeah, that's a great place to anybody who has a health issue or uh, whether it's a diagnosed mental health issue or not is just to act level of that is more centered and peaceful and relaxed and and from there good decisions can be made about health. I mean, in fact, one of the best ways to go about your healing process is to trust own innate intelligence by accessing that regularly, which can inform your mm-hmm. choices. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So my choices about nutrition and herbs and the things to do in the biochemical realm were really driven by a um, uh, letting go of um, obsessive mental processes and allowing intuition and, and innate intelligence to, to come through me. Mm-hmm. And then my choices mm-hmm. were very good. My, I made very good. Good choices were made, mm-hmm. and my health improved rapidly. When I was in, stuck in my mind spinning around with anxiety and stress, I I didn't make much progress for some years. Right. Right. Yeah, well, yeah. it's good to hear, you know. Um, so, um... Um, congratulations on on your journey and your success and on being a, um, a you know an example for people. Uh, thanks, Judy, for calling. Well, thanks, in. Are you in the healthcare field, Judy, yourself, or what? Are you in the healthcare field yourself? Um, a- actually, I I am. Um, I'm I'm in the mental health care field, um, okay. and. Um, you know, have lived experience as well. So, um, you know, I'm utilizing, um, you know, uh, a lot of, I'm trying to harness a lot of the mind, body, con- and soul connection work, you know, and through yoga and meditation to help, you know, to help me and to um, help me help others, you know. So, um, you know, and what what I see when I see people um, come in to where I work in, in like various states of distress. Um, a lot of which is, you know, it's caused by like you know um, all kinds of factors. You know, um, what's going on with their environments, what's going on with their with their homes, what's going on with traumas they've have or are experiencing. You know, I mean, all kinds of things that life is throwing at them. That's like throwing throwing their throwing them mentally, emotionally, way off balance. You know. And I wish that, um, and I hope that, you know, the, um, you know, the fields of, like, meditation and yoga and all all the other kind of, you know, my work can start to become a more instrumental part of, you know, uh, treatment response. You know, I'm not a clinician, right, but I, I do, like, outreach and crisis work and stuff on, a, on kind of the front lines. And... Um, you know, and I'm hoping that I'm hoping that kind of work becomes becomes part, of, you know, in, instituted in 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 the, in the treatment response. You know what I'm saying? Because I think that um, it's it's really without that, you're kind of missing part of the core of the rebalancing that needs to take place. And so much of you know um, trauma. Actually, there's a book I was talking to someone last night. Um, you can, you can cut me off whenever you have the next caller. Um, um, but, um, we, oh, just one more comment, Judy, because we're running out of time a little oh, bit. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, okay, so this person who who is a teacher was talking about a, a book called The Body Keeps Score and, and, you know, talking about how trauma is really stored in the body and so much is stored. Emotions are stored in the body and all kinds of things are stored in the body. So it's like cleanse and release, you really really do need to move muscles and 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 use the mind body connection to reach into that so that you have an agent, you know, to work through, you know. If that makes any sense. 
I agree, Judy, completely. I think um, that the a trauma and emotional stress is a major factor. That's why I covered my book, too, a bit. But um, you can't separate that out. You, I, so I really encourage people to you look at nutrition, environmental toxicity, lifestyle, and emotional factors and stresses. Because looking at it yeah. in the integrated approach, you get the best possible chance for success. Whereas any one approach isolated from separated... <sighs> Less of a chance of success. So, I'm glad you. Uh, yeah. I'm glad this question we got to have aired today. Okay. Thank, thanks, Judy. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Did you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to ask Jim a quick question, or kind of more of an observation. Uh, Judy mentioned something about lived experience, and that made me think of how our society is so intellectually oriented that uh, in, our own intuition often gets out of the equation when we look at our own health and the changes that we want to make. And I would like to encourage listeners to, um, you know, and Jim mentioned it in the beginning, to take responsibility for your health, but that includes trusting yourself and trusting your intuition. And, uh, you know, as Jim says, take responsibility. But um, to really to listen, learn how to listen to your body, and that will help you in, in all of your decision-making. And, you know, if you if you have a, a few seconds, Jim, you want to respond to that, but, but we need to finish up pretty quick. Okay, so... Absolutely agree, 100%. To listen to your intuition, but the starting point to listen to your intuition is to know how to distinguish between sort of obsessive mental activity and your and a real clear voice. So this is where things like Judy mentioned come, comes into play, meditation, being still. So often we mistake our intuition for just more mental activity. So however that however that comes up for you, there is a way to do it. I experienced it in my 20s. I got very clear about what to do for my health, and I did it, and it, and it worked. And, and each person has that capacity, no matter what their level of health is, they have the capacity to access that inner knowing and intelligence. So, um, okay. Thanks, I think that's Jim. It. We're out of time. Thanks for listening, I want to thank everyone for listening, and thanks for our three participants, John, Jonah, and Jim. You can search Facebook for our Mind Freedom International page and like us. And there you can find the latest news of the Mad Pride movement. Or you can visit our website at www.mindfreedom.org or email us at mfihealthconnections at mindfreedom.org. If you'd like to find out about Jim Jordan's work and his book, your health is in your hands. Visit his website at www.creative. Create. Create. Oh, create. Sorry, create vibranthealth.com, or you can email him at jim at createvibranthealth.com.